Sandbaggers Case Files, a look back at the best spy show you've never heard of. The Sandbaggers was created by Ian McIntosh, or Ian McIntosh, a former lieutenant commander in the Royal Navy. The author of five reportedly forgettable thrillers prior to The Sandbaggers, McIntosh was most famous for co-creating the BBC drama series Warship with Doctor Who writer Anthony Coburn. Warship was a popular and influential show that ran from 1973 to 1977. It followed the adventures of a fictitious Royal Navy frigate, HMS Hero, as it traveled the world defending truth, justice, and the British way. Largely forgotten today, Warship is actually quite good and deserves to be better remembered by fans of quality television drama. In the summer of 1979, McIntosh, his girlfriend, and their pilot disappeared while flying in a small private plane over the Gulf of Alaska. No trace of them was ever found. Questions have swirled around the disappearance ever since. Was McIntosh himself a covert SIS agent? Was he picked up by a Soviet sub? Did he defect? Eh, probably not. But either way, he did leave behind a lot of good television, fortunately for us, including The Sandbaggers. Episode 2, A Proper Function of Government, begins with SIS Director of Operations Neil Burnside taking another long walk and bus ride to work. Kane drops by his office with news that the Vienna station chief has reported stumbling on Donald Hopkins, the cabinet office's chief scientific advisor, at a hotel bar in Vienna. According to Sam from the ops room, Hopkins is actually supposed to be in Scotland on a week-long fishing holiday, not anywhere near Vienna. Burnside tells Vienna to put Hopkins under surveillance and sounds out Wellingham, an old friend of Hopkins. At first, Wellingham refuses to believe Hopkins could be defecting, but then he remembers that Hopkins had recently visited Moscow as part of a trade delegation. He fears that if Hopkins defects, the scandal could bring down the government. Forget that he's my friend. Tell me what you really think. Why is Donald Hopkins in Austria? He gets snow in his boots. I don't mean steel. Meanwhile, back at SIS, Kane and Denson are down in the hutch doing paperwork when Burnside's secretary, Diane, brings an urgent note. President Lutara, the dictator of an unnamed East African country, has just executed a British journalist. Kane tells Denson that this one is personal. About three and a half years ago, the boss was Sandbagger 1, I was number 2. And Sandbagger 3 was a lad called Bob Judd. He was younger than you were. It's the last time we lost a sandbagger, so we do remember it quite well. What happened to him? He died in East Africa. One of Lutara's jails? One of Lutara's anthills. He was alive when they put him on top of it, but they cut his stomach open, and the ants found the cut. And there was nothing we could do about that. Not even Neil Burnside could go for a head of state without permission. Well, oh, we might get approval now. Well, if we do, let's get one thing clear. The job goes to me. C approves Burnside's request to send Kane and Denson to Vienna to keep Hopkins under surveillance. Kane protests. Jake Landy is already out of the country doing an unauthorized favor for the CIA, and sending Kane and Denson to Vienna would mean that all three sandbaggers would be out of the country at the same time. Kane suspects that Burnside is angling to get the Lutara assassination for himself. C. agrees with the recommendation to assassinate President Lutara, but Wellingham opposes Burnside's request to carry it out himself. With zero subtlety, Burnside pledges to try reconciling with his ex-wife if Wellingham approves him carrying out the Lutara job. You'd start again with Belinda for the job. The way you married for money. What do you mean? I mean the very good reasons why you know me so well. Must be like looking in a mirror. But it's all for naught. C says the Prime Minister has turned down SIS's request to assassinate Lutara. The Prime Minister told C that he would never, ever, under any circumstances, sanction political assassinations of any kind whatsoever. 
Meanwhile, back at the main plot, Burnside suspects that the Soviets have recalled their best agent, Alexei Bunin, out of retirement to lift Hopkins because of his importance. Sure enough, Denson spots the legendary Soviet agent in Vienna. Wellingham says that, in light of Bunin's presence in Vienna, the Prime Minister has approved Burnside's request to lift Hopkins and bring him back to the UK. Oh, and if Hopkins won't come quietly, the Prime Minister has sanctioned assassinating him. Wellingham tries to convince Burnside to carry out the Hopkins mission instead of Kane. After all, if the Soviets have put their best person in the game, why not bring Burnside off the bench too? Burnside refuses to undermine Kane's authority on station, not even as a personal favor to Wellingham. Backed into a corner, Wellingham drops the hammer on Burnside. I granted you a favor, asked one of my own. I'm sorry. In other words, I have no trump card to play. Like flirting with a girl's future. So I'll flirt with yours. If you fail on this operation, I'll have you out of this office in a week. And if we are mirror images, you'll know that I mean it. In Vienna, Denson stages a traffic accident that prevents Bunin from making the rendezvous, leaving Willie clear to pick up Hopkins. Fortunately for all concerned, Hopkins agrees to go quietly. Afterwards, Wellingham takes a stroll with Burnside to bury the hatchet and wrap up everything with a bow. The cabinet office will announce his nervous breakdown. Overworked? Third is servant? The wife? If she was in it too, it was simple enough to put the house up for sale. They had no children. Kane liked him. Yes, he was a nice chap. Once again, Burnside is square with his former father-in-law, but how long can it last? In the next episode, Burnside has to decide how far is too far to go to keep one of his sandbaggers from quitting. That's next time on Sandbaggers Case Files. <laughs>